Today is October 18th, 2021, and my guest is economist and author Emily Oster of Brown University. This is Emily's fifth appearance here on Econ Talk. She was last here in November of 2020 to talk about the pandemic. Our topic for today is her new book, The Family Firm, A Data-Driven Guide to Better Decision-Making. Emily, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thanks for having me back, Russ. It's nice to see you. Good to see you, too. We're going to start by taking the idea that underlies the book, that you think it's a good idea to treat the family like a firm. Uh, so I wanted to give you a chance to talk about what you mean by that, and uh, maybe I'll give you a hard time. We'll see. <laughs> Great. Uh, I look forward to it. Uh, so, you know, when you, uh, when you say treat your family like a firm, I think in some ways, the first thing that comes to people's mind is the idea that, that like your kids are there to be profit maximized and are, you're some kind of, this is some kind of like weird business thing. Um, maybe that, is that what came to your mind, Russ? <laughs> a little bit, just because there's a famous paragraph that I love and listeners know I love out of the fatal conceit by Hayek where he talks about the dangers of taking the family out into the macro economy, the macro world of our more uh, our interconnections with strangers and commercial interactions, that that is uh, a dangerous thing. And similarly, he says it's dangerous to bring the economy into the household and uh, that you, in the one case, you're going to lead to tyranny. In the second case, you're going to destroy the family. I don't really think that's the risk at your part, but it did cross my mind. Yeah, that, that's interesting. So, I mean, I think, so when I say that you should bring that we should sort of treat our family like a firm, I think for for me it is um, it is really about the the deliberateness uh, with which we make choices, and that when we are at our jobs, we're very comfortable with the idea that the decisions that we make are interconnected. That when I make a, one decision about a project, it's related to another project, or when I make one decision, when I think about, you know, do I want to be on this committee or should I take this, should I be the department chair, that we think about how that's going to interact with all the other pieces of our of our professional life. But then when we are in our family, we often make decisions about the activities we're going to do almost without thinking about how they interact with everything else. And so we can often find ourselves in a case in which we haven't recognized the interconnection of the decisions, we haven't made them deliberately enough, and then we're living a life that's quite different in structure than we had hoped that it would be. And so the the pitch is really take some of that deliberateness from the from the the sort of work life and put it in family decisions. Give them the same kind of attention that you would to decisions that you make in your um, in your job. And I I will say sort of another uh, there there is a little bit of an aspect of this that I think is, is less comfortable for people, but which I try to push them on a little bit, which is when we are in our family and making choices, I think we often have this idea that like, oh, well, it, because we love each other, it'll all work out. Like, because we love each other, like everything will, everything will, be, will be great all the time. And I think that that's, um, you know, loving each other is, is a really important thing about having your family, but just because you love each other doesn't mean that you are like necessarily going to be perfectly aligned on, you know, whether you should do the following extracurricular, you know, that's not like, that's not about loving each other. And I think we can separate a little bit, some of these kind of day-to-day -day logistical decisions from the question of, of whether we love each other. And if we could be a little more detached about some of those, we might be able to make better decisions and then we might like each other better. It's almost like we want to like each other. We already love each other, but if we don't make good decisions, we're not going to like each other. <laughs> yeah, uh, there, there is a solution, I think, among especially among unmarried people, that married people don't disagree. And if they do disagree, of course, they don't argue. And if they do argue, they don't get loud or have fights because they love each other, right? That's why yeah. you get married, isn't it? But that's not the human condition exactly. No. Um, so I just want to mention that the, the things you were mentioning about when you were talking about what you meant by the deliberateness and purposefulness of the firm, it, there is an undercurrent of the book, I would say. The, the focus of the book is on, on, to some extent, on data and to the extent there's evidence for some of the decisions you have to make as a parent. But this undercurrent is the one I think you just emphasized now, which is the one I find so interesting, is what I would call the other piece of the economist toolkit. Yes, we have econometrics and statistical analysis. You know and listeners know that I'm not as keen on that as some are. 
but but the other book, you know, to say it lightly, says Emily, but, <laughs> but but the um, but the other side of our toolkit, which is the idea that there are unintended consequences, that there's opportunity costs when I choose one thing, like extracurricular activity, over another, that it's complex, and that doing something here will affect something over there. And then there's collective decision making and public choice problems because not only are there often two parents, but there's kids with voices and yeah. urges and, and desires. And I think, I think economics has an enormous amount to say about doing that well. And I think you're, it, it runs through the book, and the deliberateness piece of it runs through the book. And I think I've never thought about it before, but those pieces I just named: opportunity cost, unintended consequences, complexity. Those really dealing with those deliberateness is really helpful. Uh, data helps too, but if you don't have it, even just being deliberate is helpful. Yeah, and I, I think you know, for me, there was a sort of a little bit of a, a journey in this book, moving on from the earlier books, because both of my earlier books are very data forward. You know, that's kind of my that's my space. And so when I was writing about breastfeeding or sleep training or the swaddling or all these like little kid choices, there was much more of a, okay, here's the data, and you know, yeah, you're going to have to make your own decision about it. But but in some ways, the data kind of like you see the data, then you make the decision. It's sort of the data is directly linked to that. And there wasn't as much of this other stuff in the, in the background. When I came to both this era of parenting of my, my kids are now in elementary school and to this, to sort of writing about it, it became very clear that there was much less of that kind of data directly linking piece that there, that in some ways, a much more important set of choices or scaffolding or tools that we were putting in place were about how we can think about opportunity to cost, how we can think about the complexity and the interactions of these decisions, how we can negotiate with each other, with the, with the kids to try to get to, to something that, um, that sort of privileges the things that everyone cares the most about while recognizing that like every hill cannot be, you can you cannot care the most about all of the things, which I think is in some ways like a, a hard part of, of this is to say, okay, well, I, you can't just say, uh, you know, every, every single thing that we do is the most important to me. And so I tell people at the beginning, like write down, like what are the three things you most want to do every day? The three things that are most important to you. And it's three things. It's not 50 things. It's not like also we have to e exactly eat this for breakfast and do exactly this. It's like, you, they can't all be your hill to die on. You have to have, you have to have some priorities and we have to sort of work together with, with the, the fact that not everybody's priorities in the house are, are exactly, are exactly the same. I just want to mention to listeners that the very first episode of Econ Talk uh, is called The Economics of Parenting. It's with Don Cox. It's one of my favorite episodes. It's um, a lot of the early episodes I'm ashamed of because my interviewing <laughs> skills were so awful. But uh, Don Cox is a great guest, and, and I, I recommend that episode, which, which tries to take some of the things we're talking about in terms of economics and applying them to, to, to the parenting challenges. One of the things that you don't talk about I don't think, but again, is sort of a sub theme of the book is how to deal with your partner if you have two people trying to manage the household instead of one. Um, we learn a lot about your marriage. Uh, you're, there's some there's some charming uh, admissions and concessions about yourself uh, as both a parent and a spouse. But um, one of the challenges, of course, of of parenting is that for many people, often, it is a communal act, not just a, a question of you making the decisions. You've got to make them in concert with someone else who, strangely enough, doesn't always share your views. You know, people say when you get married, there are three things people fight about. Kids, money, and religion. I'm thinking, yeah, that's probably true. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, those are very broad categories. Right? And they're not just three fights. And they, that's many fights. And they come, <laughs> they come up all the time. That's yeah. the other part. Uh, but talk, talk a little bit about that because the part of the challenge of taking, a, I think, a deliberate approach toward raising children or anything in, a, in, a, in married life is that you do it with another person who doesn't always share your views. Yeah. 
so I would say one of the most interesting reactions I've gotten to the to the book is people who said, well, you know, th- this is a, like writing down, you know, what you want your day to look like and what your pri- priorities are are and what your mission is. That's great if you get along with your spouse. If you get along, you know, if you guys are, are great, then you just write it down like that's that's great. That's great for you. For you, it's so nice that you're like your your spouse. But I don't agree with my spouse about anything, and so we could never, we would never want to write this down, and. I think I was sort of pushed that back. And I would say, actually, th- that is exactly the scenario in which you do need to, to surface this, right? If you agree about everything, what's the point of right? Like, yeah, sure, maybe it's helpful to, to sort of ar- articulate things in writing. But if you're actually totally aligned, then you don't need any of this. You, this is most useful, I think, when you are, when you are encountering, when you are expecting to encounter or you are encountering conflict, in part because any co- conflicts you have about the like key priorities in your family, they will be surfaced. You know, if I think having dinner together every night is really important and my partner does not, it's not that we're going to avoid having conflict about that. That's, we're not getting around that. That's every day somebody is going <laughs> to be angry, right? But if you say, okay, let's sit down and t- talk about what, like, this is important to me. It's not important to you. What is, the, how are we going to come together and have something where I feel valued and you feel valued and we're sort of surfacing that conflict in a moment when we're not angry. It may be that you're still fighting about it. Maybe you still disagree, it may, but it's it's better than fighting about it in nitpicky ways every day. Uh, and so I think sometimes people feel like there, there's an opportunity to avoid these big conflicts. And I think in most cases, there isn't really an opportunity to uh, to avoid them. If they're important, they're going to come up. I mean, it's a really interesting question, right? You know, people say, often will say, I think to other people, marry someone who shares your values. Um, that your values are a very long list often. Yeah. Um, and you've never raised a child usually before you get married for most of us. And we find out we're in a situation totally unprepared for it. And we're shocked to find out or thrilled to find out that the person we're doing this with either doesn't agree with what's obvious or thank goodness, oh yes, he's kind of sees it the same way. But even, you know, that phrase, raising children that sees it the same way is, that's a pretty tough thing because it's, it's extremely, it's a long list of stuff. It's multifaceted. Yeah. And I think it's, it's basically impossible to imagine even the most aligned people would, uh, would agree on all aspects of how you how you want to do this. I mean, it's just, and, and everything is new. And so, you know, all of a sudden you come up to, and, you know, you know, one of the things where Jesse and I are, are like largely pretty aligned, but we, we, so I think we, we have some, there's some lack of alignment on sort of physical freedom to give the kids. Like I am much more in the camp of like, it's fine if they're like, as long as we sort of have a sense that they're safe, it's like fine for them to run around. I think he's much more cautious about that. And so a lot of, it's not so much that we have conflict, but there's a lot of like sort of working through, like what are we comfortable with them doing and how can we make it so he is comfortable. So we're both comfortable. But again, that's the kind of thing where it's like when you, you know, you meet when you're 20 in college and then, you know, even if you kind of grow up together and you, and you like each other and you think that in many ways you're aligned, you never have a conversation about like when our kid is 10, are we going to let them walk to the library by themselves? Like, that's not like, you know, it like doesn't come up and nor should it, right? We cannot write complete contracts on this. And the question is, given that your, your contract will be fundamentally incomplete on many dimensions, how do you have a process in place Place for when that comes up, that we're not just arguing about it or having somebody be uncomfortable, that we've actually worked through it. And I think a lot of the stuff in the book is really sort of tools to help people work through those questions when they do come up. Just to add one more thing on marriage, I, it's not, again, it's not the focus of your book, but you're pointing these out resonates with me. I, this idea that it's useful to surface them when you're calm and not in the middle of the thing in the middle of the, the issue that you don't agree on. And I think one of the great challenges of any kind of human interaction with, with a friend or a spouse or a family member is that if you're not careful, you get in these ruts of behavior. And I, I think of it as sort of a text of dialogue that, you know, you, you speak your line, you know exactly what the other person is going to say back. You wait, yeah. to, you're waiting for them to say it. So you can say your line. You're, you're too, <laughs> you're too protective of the children. Yeah. You don't care. You're, you're taking too many chances and it just escalates. And, and that kind of, um, uh, pain in the pit of your stomach, um, 
is is just one of the least pleasant aspects I think of, of being married and of, of what could be a more happy relationship. And I, I think the idea of having that conversation in a calm way and also being aware of the differences when they do arise, when that situation sort of falls on you that suddenly, oh, yeah, the kids got to go off on their own because so-and-so couldn't be there. And you're thinking, well, that's fine. They'll just go on their own. And the other person's going, Wah! and yeah. And that um, being sensitive to the other person's difference from yourself, I think, is a really important part of a good marriage. Um and to do it respectfully, even though, of course, the other person's a lunatic, right? I mean, how could he right. be so so paternalistic and overly concerned and not letting that kid grow on their own? I mean, what's wrong with him? But you actually have to kind of step back and think you maybe possibly have some issues yourself. And I think when you can do that, which is really hard to do, and I've been married 32 years, and I'm, I'm a little better at that than I was 32 years ago, but I wish I could be better still. It's it's hard. Yeah. No, it's hard. And I th- I think it's, uh, it's, you know, particularly, you know, particularly with kids where you both care enormously and, and you, and it's kind of like, we just like, it's the thing I care the most about and I want to do it right. And I, and you want to do it right. And so like that, that brings sort of these kind of conflicts up in ways that are very different than the conflicts that you had before kids around, you know, who's doing the dishes and did you do them right? You know, like the, the sort of emotional balance on those things is much more. But you're not talking about, you're not talking about like the toothpaste cap. I mean, that's important, but the, the dishes, yeah. you're right. That's a silly thing. Um, <laughs> exactly. I was gonna, so I, I the, who replace, replacing the uh, the toilet paper in the toilet paper holder? Exactly. I mean, it's not, which, you know, and which way it goes? Which up oh, or down, oh yeah oh my goodness important. Um, <laughs> but one of the things I think that's hardest about being a parent is being self aware about how much you care because of course yeah, of course you care about your kids everybody knows that. There's so many times I've seen parents do irrationally cruel. Um, arrogant, obnoxious, vicious things to other people because they think their kids are in some kind of, not danger, not physical danger, that you understand, right? But just sort of a little bit of emotional danger. And, you know, we have some really powerful buttons there that are deeply embedded in us. And I think, if nothing else, I think it's helpful. The deliberate part of this is is helpful for thinking about that too. Yeah, I agree. I think that there's the, there's the, I, I, for me, I would say the, one of the hardest things as, a, things as a parent is to try to let my kids work through conflicts and work through issues that they're having on their own when I basically yeah. want to go in and, you know, like yell at the other parent, yell at the other kid, like, you know, yell at the teacher. Yeah, like, you know, it's in some way, you know, you feel your kid is 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 wrong is being wronged and, and it's just hard to let them, it's hard, it's hard to let them kind of work through it themselves. I think it's important, but it's, uh, it's hard not to be a jerk about uh, about that. Yeah, no, it's um, you know, there's that great scene in It's a Wonderful Life where Jimmy Stewart loses it and screams at this te- this poor innocent teacher because his daughter's got a cold and she let him let it walk home without a coat and he's like yelling and then the the husband calls back or punches him out in a bar. I can't remember. I think he punches <laughs> him out, um, but um, anyway, pe- people get irrational. And my wife, as a high school teacher, has been yelled at. I'm by sure. That, and, and I say to her, you know, and it hurts. It's not, yeah. it's not nice. It's really a mean thing yeah. to do. But you kind of, I kind of, easy for me to say. It's, they're not yelling at they're me. Not yelling but I always, at you. <laughs> yeah. But I always think, yeah, it's just their kid. I got, it's embarrassing, but I get it. It's kind of hard. Um, let's talk about the, what you call the big picture approach. Um, you, you say without much expansion that it's a good idea to write a mission statement, which is another, way you're bringing some of what we might call business sense and or work sense into the job of being a parent. Um, that's easy to say. I'm curious yeah. what you think about that. You didn't spend a lot of time on that. What, 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 not the mission statement per se, but just when you think about keeping things in mind, big picture wise, first talk about why that's important and what do you mean by it? So I, I think it is Really what I'm sort of in, intending in this in this space is for people to sit down and think about what are the pieces of their family life that are that they they most value, that they most want to prioritize. And I think for different people, they are going to come to that. That's going to be helpful sort of coming into di- in different ways. So I think in the case of our, like sort of my family, we tend to be like very practical. So a lot of the the most important parts of that for me are not actually the kind of what is your sort of overarching mission, but literally what are the like 
three things that are most important to you to do? Like, what are the, what are like the things you want to see happening every day or every Give an weekend? example. So I think, you know, so for us, like, uh, like having, having dinner together uh, is a very central uh, a very central thing that is important to both my husband and I. And so that is like, I would sort of put, if you said like, what are the, what is the thing you want to see in your day every day? It's like having dinner with the kids. And then there is like having some time that is that where the kids are not around. So basically sleep, um, but sort of consistent bedtime. Uh, but, but you can sort of see that those things are very, they're not kind of like they're not a big picture value. They're really like, this is, this is something that is important to me to do. And it's important to me because of some larger sort of big picture value around prioritizing family time around, you know, I don't know, prioritizing spousal time, sort of things like that. But I actually, for me saying what I want to do every day is the way that I, that I, am able to connect back to these sort of bigger picture values. I think for other people, actually, they find the idea of saying their mission statement at the beginning, like, you know, like we want to raise kind, like raising kind children. That's like an example. Of, and, and so for some people saying that at the beginning, that's really helpful because then they can be like, okay, well, what, what am I going to want to do about school that's going to feed back into that? That like when I think about the decision about where to go to school, I want to remember my goal is to raise people who are nice. So when I think about where they should be in school or what, you know, how I want to expose them to sort of broader groups of people that I'm sort of connecting back to that. And so I think the intention here a little bit, I'm not, sometimes I'm not sure how, how much I achieve this in the book, but I'm interested in giving people a suite of different ways to think about uh, how how to identify what is most important to them. And for some people, that's going to be um, sort of thinking about it in the kind of broad overview sense. And for some people, that's going to be more like, actually, I need to write down what I want Tuesday to look like and realize that the things that are most important to me are these kind of chunks of the of the of the day. So I want to come back and talk about that. A little bit more from an economist perspective, but I'm I'm curious to, to at least touch on the question of um, the family meal. So we had that as a ritual, um, and it, w- it wasn't a set time. I have a good friend who their family at 6 p.m. every night. Both parents, even though they have very demanding jobs, are home at 6 p.m. every night. It's inc- incredible. Um, they've made, they decided that that was a priority for them. For us, it was more just, we would have dinner together and the time would vary. And it, over the life cycle of the children's growing up, it shifted around, of course, because of bedtime issues and other things. But I'm curious, you know, you you talk about that. There's not a lot of data on this or you you touch on it, but why do you think it's important, was important to you? Were you raised that way? Was it, was it the home you grew up in? That, that people eat together every night? Because many people don't, by the way. Many right. people, and many people would say it's silly. Yeah. You know, it, it disrupts everything else. It makes it hard to do extracurriculars. It, and and you may struggle with it as your kids get older, of course. But why do you, th- do you have an idea of why it's important to you? Yeah, so so I I, I know I think why it's important to me, um, which is that I, I did, it, it was how I grew up. And so it almost never, like it was, this was what it was like. And it almost, I would say it almost never occurred to me uh, in, until I started reflecting on it, that like there was another way. But of course, as you point out, like actually it is both the case that I don't think the data, the, the correlations in the data are very strong, but the causality in the data is very poor. And I wouldn't, if people say, you know, why do you do this? Is it because it's really important for raising successful or happy kids? I would say basically, no, you know, we do this because it's important to us. Um, and as I've thought about that, I've sort of reflected on like, well, why is it important? And I think for for me, it's important partly because um, because we, you know, we both have jobs, and now the kids are are at, are at school. And I, in the absence of this kind of thing that we have put on the calendar that we have said is important, I would worry that we wouldn't sort of have those moments to connect, right? And so it's not yeah. that those moments to connect need to be at, at meals. It's just it's convenient because we're all eating. Everybody has to eat anyway. Yeah, no, I think it's a, I think I'd never thought about it really. It, it was my wife's rule that I was happy to acquiesce in. I didn't, it wasn't a, a priority for me as I looked ahead to having children. And once we established it, I was happy to keep it. And I basically liked it. And I think, not basically liked it, I really, I think it's incredibly important actually. I'm a big fan of it. And in particular, without phones, um, 
I, mm-hmm. I struggled with that sometimes, you know, when you get the the notification and yeah. either the sound or the vibration, you, you tend to take a peek at it. And that's that, w- that was against the rules in our family. I didn't always keep the rule, but I tried uh, when my kids were around. But I think it's just an application of the quality time idea. And, mm-hmm. you know, I had an interesting interaction on Twitter with uh, a little bit with Ryan Holiday. Um, he, he said, you know, there's no such thing as quality time. All time is good. And I, there's some truth to that. But at the same time, I do think the idea of a privileged haven – in time mm-hmm. of uh, to just interact. It's nothing, there's no agenda. Although, you know, I've joked on the program, I did teach my kids a lot of economics at that dinner table and sure. quiz them on statistics and all kinds of things that they may regret. And it could have been a terrible mistake <laughs> to have family time at dinner. But but um, it does give you that time of, the, it, it, it creates more than just a minute or two. It's it's more of an oasis. Yeah. That's, yeah I- that's somewhat large. I, I I agree with that, but I, I think that you know it's it's also one of these things where where people have to sort of think about what it like how how this can it's an it's like a it's an investment it's not and it's not always yeah. it's not always feasible and it's like you know actually producing a meal for our people that people will eat you know it it, is, it has its its own challenges and so I, I you know I sort of urge people to kind of. I almost I like that frame of like it's a quality time it's like a sort of central quality time but it it there may be ways that sort of families want to do that, that are different than having it be at the, at the meal. And I think it's the sort of protected time that, that for me is the most, is the most valuable piece. But I would say, you know, we're like, we're probably closer to like, it's, it's very important that one person be there. And ideally like during the pandemic, obviously it was always both of us as we have sort of emerged a little and we're, we're kind of traveling more. I think we get to like, ideally it's all four of us, but the the kind of it is it is always dinner is a sex for the kids and it is almost always and it is one of us or the, sometimes the long term nanny who is like sort of there connecting with them. Yeah. yeah, as they get older, you will find Emily in your next book that it's a little more challenging. Now my Both kids are never gonna not want to be with me, Russ. So thanks. Oh, <laughs> I forgot like, to tell you. Yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. What was I thinking? It's no, they will want to be with you. They will want to be with you, but not quite as long as you want to be with them. Sometimes. Yeah, I bet. So so there's uh, there's you know there's two things that can happen. Not my family either, of course. But uh, there's the how was school fine, and then the quality time is over. <laughs> Even though they're not on their phone, they're not always interacting. It's a bit of a challenge sometimes. I think for some people. And then there is the I've got to go. I've got work to do. I have homework, whatever. And they jump up from the table seven, you know, seven minutes after the food was put down. If you're not, and you know, you push back against it, but you can't push back against it necessarily as much as you'd like because yeah. you don't want them to be miserable at the table either. So it's, no, a, it's I a challenge. When I was in high school, my mother had um, I. Uh, there was some, we sort of got to some place where it was like, I was supposed to be home for like two nights a, a week for it. There was like, so we had some set of rules. It was like some small number of nights I did need to like show up, uh, show up for dinner. But there was a tremendous amount of bribing with like food. It was sort of because I was, I went to a, I went to a, a boarding school, even though I didn't live there. And so most of the time I was in the dining hall, which wasn't that great so it was like basically like if you come home for these two nights i will cook anything you want on those two nights so yeah it's uh it counts though it's important it counts it counts i mean she's a really good cook (laughs) and those meals were are immortal you know they're part of your self that are you'll always treat them those i'm sure you remember some of what those meals were i i do remember many of those Uh, yeah okay um and I, I do want to say, by the way, I, I don't like to to stereotype teenagers. And uh, my kids were overwhelmingly wonderful in, in their teenage years most of the time. And I was very appreciative but it of that. Is, I so mean, I it is age appropriate. It is like, you know, yeah, it's age appropriate it's to want to separate different. there. Yeah. Yeah, for, absolutely. Except for your children who won't. Except for mine. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I want to talk about the principle of a priority. And um, uh, as listeners know, I have a new a book coming out. I think when this episode airs, you could pre-order it on Amazon. It's called Wild Problems. And I'm critical in there. And Emily, as it turns out, has actually read a manuscript of the book, which is very cool, which I appreciate. It's really uh, good. We, Everybody should pre-order that, it. You're very kind, Emily. <laughs> um, one of the things I, I criticize in there is, is the idea that we should be maximizing all the time. And in a certain sense, this is a straw man of the economist's view. Obviously, economists think about the long run and not just the moment to moment. But 
But I do think we have a human challenge when we naively employ the tools of economics, which you do not do this in your book, but I want to bring it out. On any one night, it might be a burden to have dinner with the family. You know, there, there, there's this, this party you needed to go to or this concert you wanted to see or this work thing at work that was pretty important. And, and yet, as you called it an investment, and it's not always clear what you're going to get in the long run, but that decision is it to, to, to prioritize and value that family meal, and this is true of thousands of other moments of parenting, is a decision that the pleasure and pain of the moment doesn't really represent what the goal of the firm is, even though it sometimes feels that way. And I think, I think that's an incredible challenge of parenting. It's why tantrums are effective yeah. <laughs> uh, and why we should not usually give in to them and, and we don't want to encourage whining in the future for sure. But it's more just a realization that you, not, not just you have to take a long view, but it's not, about, it's not just about how happy you are day to day. There's something else being created, in this case, a feeling that you're part of something, the, 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 your family. And I think, you know, for me, when we talked about a minute ago about why the family meal is important. You know, we we both said, well, you interact and you you connect, but you're creating something there called your family that you expect to have a long term uh, sense of identity from connections, all kinds of complex things that go way beyond what we might call utility in the narrowest sense. And I to re reflect on that and and how the big picture concept that you mention and stress actually in the book is important for, for making sure you don't make that mistake. So I, I think, I mean, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I think part of what so many of these things reflect is kind of almost doing some hard, some hard things in the moment because you are right. trying to, you know, build people or build, like build people, build your kids into people who are like going to, be happy and productive members of society and that you're trying to build a sort of family unit that is going to stay and that is going to be, uh, you know, is going to be resilient and is going to, is, is going to provide opportunities for those, for the kids to thrive, for you to be happy, for those relationships to be there. But in the moment of doing those things, um, even if you know that, that like, the, the thing that you're doing is contributing to that in the, in the long term. it is, there are many, many times with particularly, you know, with it, where you're just like, what am I doing? You know? And so for me, like a huge piece of this is like sort of encouraging independence. This is like, so, so we spend a lot of time with our kids, like trying to get them to do and to do stuff, like to be like responsible for thing X. Okay. And so it's like, you're responsible for making your own breakfast. Okay. And be in putting a, like a six-year-old in giving them responsibility for making their own breakfast is excruciating. Even though I know, <laughs> like, I know it is the right thing. And I know in the, in the sort of broad scheme of it, like, I don't want to be making the breakfast of a 16 year old, like, and, and sending them off to college, expecting that like someone will be putting like a plate of bacon in front of them every, every morning, you know, like, I don't want, like, I know I don't want that, but you know, the sort of like, I can't reach the bowl. I need a step stool. Where's the milk? Like the sort of the, the kind of getting there in many of the moments is, is hard. And you want to be like, all right, I'll just do it. Like, I'll just do it for you. And I think, or you want to just say, you know what, like you're not willing to sit at this meal or you're whining about what we're serving or you're, um, you know, ob objecting, you don't want to do this particular piece of homework or you don't want to invest, like you don't want to do whatever. And you just kind of want to give in. And I think that, that there is a little bit of a value to having said upfront, okay, no, this is important. Um, this is important to us and we're really like important to our family. And so therefore we are going to follow through even when it is hard in the moment. And I will say, this is a place for me where having a partner that is on the same page, like where you have agreed on something is so yeah. valuable because like things like this, like our kids are supposed to get their own breakfast. I'm like terrible at following through because I get so frustrated. And, and my husband is, is frequently like, you know, like, t well, it'll be like, remember, be like, don't okay. touch that fork. Right, exactly. Like, just like, you know, like, Joe, like, like, didn't we? <laughs> so I said, be like, is this part of the food policy? <laughs> like, fine. Okay. <laughs> like, so I think there, there is some value there. But yeah, I mean, in the, in the moments, it's so much easier often to just 
kind of give in. Yeah, one of my favorite moments in the 800 plus episodes of Econ Talk was Ed Lehmer of UCLA giving the example of a student that he had mentored over the summer. And then the student, uh, after the experience ended and, and Ed had given her lots of free reign to learn things and not tell, instead of telling her things, which was two different modes of, yeah. of instruction. And she said, she wrote him an email and she said, I was on Santa Monica Pier the other yesterday or today or whenever, and I saw a father teaching his son how to fish. And he let his son hold the fishing rod. And she said, all my teachers before they held the fishing rod, and they figured I'd figure it out. You're the first teacher ever let me hold the fishing rod. And That's I thought, awesome. you know, it's most beautiful. It gives, it gives me goosebumps every time I tell the story. Wow. It makes me cry. But because first of all, it's the greatest thing a teacher could ever get yeah. email. But but I think as a, as a parent, it's a tremendously valuable lesson because you're a better fisher, fisherman or fisherwoman than your kid. And you're better cook and you're better kitchen sous chef and get out of my way. Yeah. I'll take care of this. And it's so hard not to grab the fish around and say, let me show you. And then you rationalize it to yourself because you say, well, they're seeing me do it. And that's kind of the same thing. I'm modeling fishing for them. <laughs> exactly. and they'll, they'll watch me and they'll learn how to do it because when they get older, they'll see how it's done. And it's just, um, it's really hard. Yeah, it's really hard. I agree. So you just said as if it's the most normal thing in the world, uh, you know, you want your kids to be productive and happy and, and contributors to society. Is that your big picture goal for your children? Because you don't talk about it in the book. You sort of take that as a given that that would be two things. I think you used that phrase at some point, but certainly many people would say that's their goal. I think a lot of people just want their kids to be happy. Um, they don't care about the productive part. Um, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I would like my kids. I would like my kids to be happy. I would like them it's sort of an interesting question of like, what do you, what do you mean by productive? Like I would like them to like to do yeah. good to produce. So I don't mean productive in like rich or, you know, but like, I would like them to contribute to society in some positive way. Um, I would like them to be nice. Um, and, you know, I, I think when I think about my, my goals, like some of my goals for this phase, phrase, phase, for this phase of life, it <laughs> is kind of, it is kind of to, to raise them to be, to be adults, um, and to be, uh, sort of respectful and, and thoughtful about, about other people. Um, so I think when I say productive, I don't, I don't mean like, yeah, I don't mean like, like rich. really good at making widgets. Exactly. I don't mean really good at <laughs> making widgets. That's um, my mission statement. Yeah, turn my like, kid into the best turn widget maker. Turn my kid into the best widget maker. <laughs> so good at widgets. Um, so, so we had Paul, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I mean, I think one of the things that's, that's, um, that's sort of interesting as you, as you like your kids become, become themselves is, is it's actually really hard to, to let them find the things that they are, they are interested in being good at, because it is very easy to see the things that you, pri that you prioritize and the things you've got. It's easy to yeah. prioritize the things that you're good at. Right. And to, and, and I, I think what's really hard is when your kid is good at something that you're not good at or not good at the things that you're good at to kind of f figure out that balance of, you know, how much do I want to push them in various ways or not push them or let them go. And I think everybody kind of comes down on that a little differently. Yeah. I think it's a fascinating thing that we want our kids to be a lot like us, even though we don't want to be like our parents. There's a little paradox there for yeah. folks. <laughs> you might want to yeah. chew on for a bit. Think um, about that. <laughs> Yeah, it's. I've never thought about it that way, but I think that's. Um, yeah, that's kind of sums it up. Uh, and I, we have an episode coming out um, with Paul Bloom that you haven't heard yet because it's not out, but it's recorded where he quotes Dan Gilbert. And I'm going to invite Dan to the program, by the way. So you know, Paul and I both disagree with Dan, at least the way we understood it. Um, but Dan had this image of suppose you could sit in a swimming pool with a drink in your hand and it's a beautiful day, weather's perfect, nice breeze wafting over the uh, over the pool and that's 95% of your day, really pleasant. And then the 5% is kind of a downer because you're sitting there feeling guilty that all you do is sit in the pool all day. And the way I understood Paul's summary of Dan is that, really, is there anything wrong with sitting in the pool? 90, if you're happy, I mean, and, and, and Dan's proof, according to Paul, I think this is based on a private email, so that's why I'm being somewhat um, 
uncertain about it. We well, wouldn't want your kid to have that level of happiness. And certainly compared to the reverse, 95% of tor- torment for you know 5% of meaning or productivity or whatever you decide is the thing that should be other than the pool. And I don't agree with Dan Gilbert yeah. as, as I understand it. Um, and I'll just say it that this way. I don't agree with the idea that if we're happy 95% of the time and the other 5% of the time we just feel guilty about it because we're not doing anything else productive. Uh, I don't, I don't want to live that life. I don't want my kids to have that life. They may choose to. Um, but what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't, uh, that isn't the life that I would, uh, that I would want. Um, and I think I would not want that for my kids. Um, I would not want that for my kids either, but it's, it's just sort of an interesting thing to think about, like, but why, like, why not? Why not? You know, yeah. what, like, what is it about the, and I think, I think part of it is that the sort of the, the highs associated with success after, after struggling or with sort of thinking like I worked hard at this and, and I, I achieved it or I worked hard at this and I feel good about what came out of it or what, like, I think those highs for me are very high. Um, and worth the, the sort of struggle pieces, um, and the, the sort of happiness of sitting in the pool feels flat in some ways. Uh, and I'm not, but I'm not, I have I have never tried <laughs> to sit in a pool for that, you know, to ha- sort of to, to invest in that way. And so I think part of, part of what is interesting for me to, to, is that like, I have always, and you're probably like this too, like sort of thought about professional success and success in these various ways as kind of like, okay, you work and you work and you work to get this thing and like to get the next thing and, um, and to achieve in various ways. And I'm, I'm very happy. It not, not 95% of the time, but like in a sort of broad sense, I'm very satisfied with like what has, what has been wrought by that approach to, uh, by that approach to life. But I think there is a question of like, is that the only, is that the only way that one, uh, could, you know, be happy. Well, I, I I think I've spent five and a half hours talking to you, Emily. I don't know you very mm-hmm. well, but I think you're a lot like me. I think you actually like working. I think yes. you kind of just hinted at that. Like we're a little bit strange. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think it's for me. And I'm at least emotion intellectually. I may not be. I may be fooling myself. But for me, the it, it's not about. Um, it's first of all, it's a drive to contribute, which is I think was put in me by my parents. I don't have a, I, I could I could tell you a story about why it's the right thing to believe, but I don't think that's where it comes <laughs> from. But I also think you're right about the idea that it's about overcoming, which is part of what Paul Bloom's book's about. The sweet spot is about the idea that some suffering is is important for creating what we might call real happiness or deeper happiness, satisfaction, contentment, and I I don't think. The only point I would just, I think, disagree with you on a little bit is that it doesn't all have to be, quote, productive in the work sense in any way. Mastering a language, a musical yeah. instrument, things that are, quote, useless. They're not useless, actually, but things that don't have monetary payoff, uh, usually. Uh, I think those are those are okay, too. I don't think you want to do that all day, either. Usually, you have to eat. So, you know, that's part of the problem is sitting in the pool for 95% of your time usually means the pool's not very nice and the the the, the thing you're sitting on is not very comfortable and the water's either really cold or whatever but uh, this, and the the drinks cheap and the snacks are bad yes. so <laughs> that's a little complicated um let's let's turn to the question of data and analysis which you spend a lot of time in the book uh being incredibly honest about how lousy most of the empirical workers on some of the questions that every parent cares about deeply. What should my kid eat? What kind of school should they go to? Are extracurriculars good for them or bad for them? How much sleep should they get? When should they go to bed? Should it be a fixed time? You know, all these questions, there's a lot of analysis. There's a lot of peer-reviewed research on it. But I'd say on average, you come down saying, and of course I'm prejudiced to, to believe this, but I think you come down saying most of it's of limited value, but not zero. Is that a fair summary? I think that's a fair summary. I mean, I think that there are there are places in those examples that you gave where the data is better and places where it's worse. And so, you know, in something like sleep, I think we are pretty convinced that sleep is important. Um, you know, that inter- like that that and that you know, if kids like that if you take away even a relatively small amount from the sort of typical amount that kids need, that it it negatively affects various aspects of their mood and and so on. 
I'm pretty sure parents in 1437, before Ari <laughs> Fisher came along, and, and the more well, sophisticated now forms we have of data an analysis. RC. <laughs> Now we know that from an RCT. Um, so yeah, so some of the pieces, and I, I think it's fair to be like, okay, well, the places where you have really good data, it was totally obvious before. Okay, fair enough. Um, uh, but I think there are there are there are many places where we are we are less sure where then the the data is is not very good. And so, I mean, for me, like the sort of nutrition food stuff is kind of the, the top of that list. I think in general, we know almost nothing convincing about uh, what is the right, like the healthy diet, the right thing to eat. I mean, we know a little bit about how you can encourage kids to eat a particular way if you if you want to. And that research is kind of interesting, but people behind that, they want to know, okay, well, like, should I invest in all this stuff about vegetables? Like, what, like, what is that? Is that worth it? And, and then you have to be like, well, we don't really have any, no, I, we don't have any idea. Um, and I think that's, uh, you know there, there there are ways in which that's very that's very frustrating, particularly in uh, in a space where I I almost think we've started to to get and maybe this is partly the fault of people like me to get into a, a world where we think of data as like the way to get the answer. Like okay, well just like like we're going to be, I'm going to be like a data parent. Somebody used that word to me the other day. Like, you know, like uh, you're like the head of the data parents. Okay. Um, and that, you know, somehow doing, doing that, being a data parent is about thinking that data is going to give you the answer to everything. And in some ways, some of the message of this book is like in these choices, data is almost never going to give you the answer. You know, it's a, it's a part of it. It's there, there's evidence you can collect that will help you inform some of these decisions, but, uh, but it's, it's not going to, it's not going to be the answer. And there's too much heterogeneity across kids. There's too much heterogeneity across choices. The data is too, is too limited. Um, for it to to ever like really be the the answer, um, I think that's that's frustrating because you want to get it right, uh, and it's very hard for people to realize that they are going to make these choices and they're not going to know if the choice is correct. They're just going to have to do it, and they're not going to know exposed either. I mean, that's the most challenging I think part about this as a parent. You know, you make a decision, you think it's the right decision, and you see the outcome and you have no idea if it was the right decision because there's so much else that happened along the way. And I think that's right. I mean, I think there are some, there are some more mundane decisions where I think we do have an opportunity to like evaluate later. Yeah. Was it right? You know, like, okay, we choose to, and, but I don't think people always do it, but I think sometimes you say, okay, we're going to choose to do this like sort of high intensity extracurricular. There should be an opportunity for, to follow up at the end of that and say, okay, like, should we do this again? Right. Was it the right decision to, to do that? But in the, in anything that's like sort of big decisions, like, did I adopt the right kind of priorities? Was it right to invest all this time in having these family dinners and going to sleep early? Or, you know, should I have moved? to a different city and put my kids in a different kind of school, you know, you'll never know the answer to that and not ex ante, not exposed. And one thing about the book that I think is very useful is that not as much for me personally, because my kids are now older, but for people with, with younger kids that will soon be older kids and, and with lots of decisions to be made is that you know, I like to say parenting doesn't come with a manual. They, you know, I send you out from the hospital. And <laughs> it's really irresponsible. You know, you've got a car seat by law usually, but that's kind of it. And you really <laughs> don't know what you're doing. Um, and I, I would encourage – when you think as a parent about the big picture, I would encourage would-be or current parents to talk to other parents because there's so many things you don't think of, you don't know about. And I think one of the values of your book to people with kids who are struggling with these issues – she give a lot of different examples of pluses of different choices that you can make on these trade-offs. And I think for a lot of parents, it never crosses their mind. I mean, they don't think about what's important often. I didn't. I struggled to do that. It's just hard for anybody to remember those things. And, you know, it's – I have a friend. He's, he's amazing. He's always – he's got children, his children younger than me. He's always asking me, how would you deal with this with you when you were a parent? And I always think – makes first of all, it makes me feel really good because it makes me feel important. I love that. <laughs> Uh, we all do. But I think he actually, it's possible he could learn something. He may not agree with it, may not take what I say as, value, as personally useful, and may not implement it. But I think it's, um, it's such a big space uh, of what you can do as a parent. And I don't think any one parent has, has only the vaguest idea of what's going on. And it's good to talk to other parents. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's good to, I, you know, 
I, I almost think when you're thinking about like, you know, what do you want your, what do you want your day to look like? What do you want your time to look like? To just be like, what are the different ways people do this? Because I think if you, if you, we have some image from our own childhood, from our partner's childhood, from the few people we know of like, this is, and you can get into like, well, that's the only, that's the only way. And like, actually, no, there's often like many, you know, many good ways to, to, to do these things. And, and, you know, many, many different, uh, many different approaches, but you never find out what they, you never find out what they are unless you ask. Um, and people figure out all kinds of things that, yeah. that they turn, you know, just trivial things like what, what gives them pleasure as a parent or the fam- creates good things for the family. There's just, there's a lot of innovation that goes, yeah. goes from trial and error that happens on the ground. And your book has lots of examples of it. So I think that's, that's extremely useful, but I also encourage people to talk to other parents generally. I think um, we all have a lot to learn. I want to come back to this question of heterogeneity in the data. Um, a couple of places, and I think this is a general problem in, in, in econometrics and, and data analysis, and I'm curious if you agree with me. In a lot of examples, um, you find the, the effect is small, say, between, say, two different choices. And it's tempting, as you do occasionally conclude, so this means probably it's not a big deal, which when you decide, and you might decide it based on other things, not just – you know, whatever the outcome is that's at issue there. And one of the themes of your book, which I love, is that, you know, a lot of things we care about that aren't measurable right. at all. Uh, things like test scores are measurable, so those tend to be what we look at when we look at effects of schooling. There are things like values, there are things like happiness, there are all kinds of other things beyond test scores. But this issue of heterogeneity seems to me to be very important. I'm thinking about, um, for example, um, a medical intervention. And you know, we've had a lot of guests on the program who find that a lot of medical interventions either don't work or have negative impacts compared to what they're expected to do. And I wonder if that's – I think that's true on average. But I wonder mm-hmm. for some extreme cases – just to take an example, we've been, we were talking recently with uh, Johan Hari about depression. He's very skeptical about the value of uh, pharmaceutical intervention, as am I. And is it maybe the case that – Many antidepressants have no impact, but that for some people they're life changing, and it's not just random that you, you know, they fooled themselves into, you know, because it was exposed, they figured it must have been the drugs, but actually they were life saving or other things like that. Um, and I think, especially for child raising, one of the challenges is not just stuff isn't measurable, you have much more information yeah. about your children. Than, than the data analysis can possibly look at subtleties about jealousy or needs or urges or in, insecurities. And so I often, I think we often do things as parents that would never be in the data because you don't have a d- data point on insecurity, say. And I, I just wonder whether the overall findings of small effect may mask important effects for a very small subset of children under, under duress or challenge. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so I think in general, treatment effect heterogeneity, um, which is sort of what you're describing, is very is like a a, a challenge. Um, in these, I mean, there's already we sort of talked about the data is already very weak, even if you're looking at at often at average effects to try to to separate out different different groups. I think is even um, even more of a of a uh, of a challenge. Um, you know, I think part of what In some ways, you know, part of what is uh, what has to go into this decision making is the is what you know about your um, is what you know about your your kid and many many of these things like what's the right school? Well, that's not like there's not an answer. To, there's no answer to that question. You know, there's no answer to that question. And and you know, as people talk about um, you know. One of the, one of the things I talk a lot to parents about is like sort of private schools versus public schools, right? And so people like sort of come in and say, you know, well, on average, like, you know, are the outcomes for kids in private schools better? Yes. Is the sort of causal effect po- positive? Is probably positive. Is probably small. Who, like, who knows? The data is not very, very good there. You can kind of work all through that. But then, you know, if you talk to people whose kids have um, who sort of need like more scaffolding kids who have ADHD or some, you know, like sort of are on the spectrum in some, uh, in some way, often people will come and be like, it's much more important for my kid. Like public school is like infinitely better for my, for my particular kid because, uh, it, because of public schools, sort of public schools have a, have a, a responsibility to, to, in more the U S to like, 
yeah. more infrastructure, more ability to deal with her, with heterogeneity in that way. And that's something where like, if you had some kind of slavish, like a, a adherence to the, to the data and be like, okay, there's, you know, there's a small positive effect of on test scores from being in a private school from this study in Milwaukee about, you know, school vouchers. And so like, definitely private schools are better. You would of course totally miss that actually there's a large number of people for whom, or some number of people for whom the treatment effect is, is in the opposite direction and potentially extremely large. And so I think that's, that, you know, that and many other examples highlight these places where you think, you know, well, actually like our, our, our average of small effects may be made up of large effects in both directions, you know, that are kind of averaging to zero for small numbers of people. And for most people, it's, it's nothing. And I think uh, that's, um, that is hard data. How has writing this book changed your views as a parent? You've written three books now on uh, raising children and being a parent, being a, a person, being pregnant, raising an infant, and then now uh, a elementary school age kid. Um, I wonder if day to day being an author about parenting makes you think about it more, first of all. And secondly, did, did writing the book change anything you actually do in your family that as a result of, of writing it? Yeah, it it did. I mean, it's it's interesting because both of the other books that, that you're I, comfortable that you're right, comfortable yeah, talking no, about. No, no, it's none I, of my it, business, right? No, that's all right. Um, I think what sort of was interesting for me is both of the other books were very much like sort of written like almost post the experience. So you know, I wrote a lot of expecting better while I was pregnant, but I kind of like finished it after when I had once I was done being pregnant, at least the first time. And then when I wrote Crib Sheet, like, it was sort of like, I was writing it kind of as my younger kid aged out of the, of the sort of age range of, so I, and people ask like, well, was your parenting influenced by, by what you did? It's sort of like, not really, because I, I was like looking back. <laughs> it was too done. late. It was too late. <laughs> it was too, would have been, but, but this is, this book is sort of very much was very much written in the midst of like when we're doing this, um, when we're sort of parenting this, um, this age. And I think it has influenced, um, it has influenced some of my, um, some of my choices, partly in the direction of just a little more like practice what you preach, which is like, you know, I think that we, we were already doing some of this sort of deliberateness. I think we are probably more deliberate now than we, than we were before about sort of thinking about how the, the structure of the, um, you know, of, of our lives should be. And when we have, um, as our kids have, have now gotten older and our job situation is, has various more complicated, complicated pieces, sort of making sure that we're kind of like writing out the schedule if somebody is going to be on sabbatical somewhere more distant and sort of figuring out how, how things can, um, how things can, can work. So I think that, that there's been some influence, um, some influence, uh, influence there. Yeah. Now we've been talking about how the power, the the value of being deliberate, but some might say, and I even think you might even concede yourself, that not everyone wants to be as deliberate as Emily Oster. Yeah. She's really into Google Docs, postmortems like on the like decisions, it. and so on. Yeah. You, she likes it. You like it, right? I do. Um, but there's a certain type, you know, there's a certain type of person who finds that exhilarating and comforting. Other people, it gives them the willies and it scares them. Um, have you experienced that in, in, with the book? Definitely. So some people find, um, I think the, some people find the book overwhelming. Um, and they're sort of like this, like I would never do these things. And I think some people, <laughs> it's fine. I think some people have more of a sort of like philosophical, like, well, this, you know, I like to be, I like think, to be like sort of freer. And this seems, you know, this seems like a little too, too crazy. And I think that's, you know, I think that's fair. Um, I, uh, you know, we, I definitely sort of take this to a place where not everyone would want to, to take it. I, I do think that actually for many people, pieces of this might be useful. So that even if you said, if you sort of, you weren't going to like run every decision through some kind of like complicated thing and be deliberate in all of these ways. Actually, I think for a lot of people, there's some value to the occasional Google doc or to, to sort of stepping back and saying like, Hey, you know, when I think about whether, we're going to engage in, uh, in travel soccer this fall. And are we going to do, you know, four practices a week and spend every weekend? Like, is that, do we want to do that? Let's just take like a, take a pause, not just decide to do that because like somebody whined about it, but like sort of take a 
pause on some of these these bigger uh, these bigger decisions. I think many people would benefit from a, like a little bit of that, and there's a way to sort of pull yeah. in some of these pull in some of these pieces without going sort of like full hog, like you know every um, kind of do do every do every piece of it. I mean, somebody told me, I would say like one of the most gratifying responses I got was somebody who was like, you know, I sat down with the book and I read, I thought about it. And we did one thing, which was that we decided at the beginning of each week, we would establish upfront who was going to pick the kid up from daycare. So we didn't fight about it every day. Yeah, and that was, it. it was just like one tiny thing was like, but, act, and they were like, actually it's really improved things because uh, <laughs> we were fighting about this every day. And now we yeah. talk about it on Sunday and we don't fight about it. And so I think that's, that's an example of like, you could, you could just add a little bit of deliberateness on some particular pain point and maybe it would help. Yeah. And you don't have to go full Emily. You, have to go full you could Emily. just go, yeah. Just go look a little. Um, yeah. Just, just, just a bit. Uh, last question. Uh, do you think you'll write a book about teenagers, middle schoolers? Is, is it, do you plan on it? Is it something you think about? I think about it. I haven't planned on it. I mean, I think part of it is my kids are not in that phase yet. Um, so maybe I should do that one in advance. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I think it is, uh, you know, those with this book, I felt like I had it. I had a sort of message that I wanted to convey. Um, I think a book about teenagers would probably like, again, be back to being sort of more data forward, but I'm not sure how much data there is there and how much there, there is to sort of learn about those things. So let's see. My guest today has been Emily Oster. Her book is The Family Firm. Emily, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks for having me. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.